Hi everybody, um, lovely crowd here. Uh, it's my honor and I hope your pleasure to be in the company of two really remarkable writers um, whose work I hope many of you are familiar with already, but if not, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, Suki Kim is a novelist and an investigative journalist and she has the, the, one of the, an amazing, the amazing distinction of being one of the first writers or the first writer to go undercover in North Korea um, where she lived and taught for, um, about, was it almost a year? Six months. Six months. Um, and from that, from that time in North Korea, she's written the most remarkable book, um, Without You There Is No Us. Uh, her first book before then was a novel. She's also a novelist called The Interpreter. Uh, and she's won many, many prizes and many fellowships and, is, and has published in many uh, 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 great publications that I won't list right now. Um, she's sitting next to Michael Resendez who is a member of the Spotlight investigative team uh, at the Boston Globe, where he has been since 1989. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, have, are familiar with the film Spotlight, which came out of the investigation he and his team did into the abuse of children by Catholic priests in the Boston area. Um, and that, that investigation won a Pulitzer in 2003. Uh, Michael has been a finalist for many other uh, Pulitzers, and he's the co-author of two books, including Betrayal, the Crisis in the Catholic Church. Um, on, from the outside, they're both quite different writers who have tackled very different places and different subjects. But I find it striking that, in a way, they're both dealing with impenetrable, inscrutable entities. Um, Michael was looking at the Catholic Church in Boston, and Suki was obviously entangle, entangled in North Korea. Um, but they approached this from, in very, from, various, uh, from very different routes. Um, Suki, I wanted to ask you, you know, you, uh, this is a project you did independently, you had a book contract to go there, but you were by yourself, more or less, um, and you took this great risk. What was it like embarking on this immense project by yourself um, and with all the challenges you knew you would face? Uh, first of all, I mean, it was uh, overwhelmingly difficult. I was, um, I didn't, if I had known how impossibly difficult it would be, I don't think I would have, you know, planned it from the beginning that way. But. Also, because I, I was on my own um, every step, I went to North Korea five times throughout a decade. And each time it was an organization that I uh, found myself and pursued myself and um, went in. I mean, as a freelance writer, you know, editor really, really deals with the finished product, but it's not like they're gonna help you with a team. So, I mean, that's a, difficult aspect of reporting on your own and finding everything on your own. Um, but I think also the overwhelming feeling, sure, North Korea itself was such a, a huge subject that couldn't be uh, infiltrated in any way, but I think realizing, I, want, I went for the first time in 2002 through an organization that I found that was very pro Kim Jong-il organization, uh, and posing as one of them was the beginning of the whole thing, but realizing I think each time when I, I went in how impossible it was to get any truth, which meant the only answer, you know, I went and covered the New York Philharmonic in Pyongyang for Harper's Magazine, how little journalists get to see, and the little you see are actually lies. So you go report that and you've now just um, you are complicit to the world's most brutal regime. So your writing actually can be used against you is I think another lesson. So I think that doing that, also defector research, I guess we can talk about that later, uh, how difficult defector research was also, because defector research depends on where you're interviewing that defector. In a hiding place in China, or is it in Mongolian desert, or is it in a detention cell in Thailand, or is it in South Korea years later, sitting in comfort? So wherever you interview those defectors um, came with a different answer. And if a lot of those were, for example, lies that I can't print that lie because what the consequence was so huge because whatever I write actually will be about North Korea and it's one of the most uh, devastating subjects in the world.
So I think that arriving at that solution that I have to go live there amongst North Koreans, I think that realization when it did dawn on me through my research was really scary because finding a way to go in there and to live there, which I ultimately did, itself is scary, but would I be able to pull it off? Chances are no, because it's, it's uh, a frightening place. So I think this was a step by step by step. So it was daunting. Um, and I guess I just could only focus on what was ahead of me and take it each step since it did take a decade. Michael, with uh, investigations like those run by Spotlight, inevitably, by definition, they're collaborative. They're, they're, team, they're team enterprises. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, you're bringing your personal histories and your, and your backgrounds into this kind of reporting. Um, I was wondering, and this is, I guess, suppose about you, but also about your colleagues when you were investigating the, the church and the, the sexual abuse scandal. Um, to what extent did your, did your background and did your, your colleagues' backgrounds also as Catholics, or being raised Catholic, have an influence on the way you thought about the issues, your motivation, um, and the reporting itself? Yeah, I think it was uh, important that uh, all of us on the Spotlight team came from Catholic backgrounds. Uh, we were a group that came together uh, fairly recently before we started investigating the Catholic, the Catholic Church. We had only done one project together. So this was our second project, and we were still getting to, to know uh, one another. And I do remember there was a moment when we were sitting around, the uh, four of us, and it suddenly became clear that we had all been raised Catholic. And I think that gave us a, a very interesting uh, perspective on the story. I think, uh, first of all, we, we knew what it meant to be a Catholic. We knew why uh, a young single mother would entrust her three or four children to the care of a priest. Uh, you know, when we started writing, a lot of people came up to me and said, Jesus, how could anyone leave their children alone with a priest? But we, we knew that the priest was the one person in the community that you would leave your children with. The priest was the most trusted person in the community. The priest was a paragon of morality. So there was no uh, steep learning curve uh, for us when it came to learning sort of the, the mores of the Catholic Church and the mores of Catholic communities. Moreover, I think because of what we discovered, I think our capacity uh, for outrage was, was pretty large. Uh, we interviewed some victims uh, of clergy sexual abuse together, uh, some victims who had a lot of information about priests who were abusive. And uh, I think uh, our collective uh, outrage and anger over what we were discovering uh, really motivated us to get to the bottom of the story and do the best job we possibly could. And I'm not sure our outrage would have been as high uh, if we were not Catholics uh, reporting on our own uh, communities, uh, reporting on our own upbringing in a way. So I think the fact that uh, just by, by luck, really, uh, the fact that we were, I mean, being a Catholic was not a criteria for being on the Spotlight team. So it was really kind of a, a lucky coincidence that we all had uh, very strong backgrounds in the Catholic faith. You know, in, in some sense, both that project, that, that investigation, and, and uh, the, the Rio book um, are about kinds of complicity. Um, in, in, in term, Michael, in terms of your book, in, in terms of the, the Spotlight investigation, um, the complicity of a city, of a church, of other institutions and other you know, sectors of society, um, of, of individuals um, in keeping that kind of silence. Um, and and Suki, the many kinds of complicity in, in, in your work, not the complicity of journalists, of, 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 of outsiders, um, and also when and I suppose, and maybe you'll disagree with me here, and I, maybe complicity is the wrong word, but when you describe in such amazing, sometimes terrifying detail, the way, um, the way your students, your North Korean students, would think about the regime, would, a would act in public, would be suspicious of each other, um, and, and, would, and would, would be un unable to question certain kinds of inherited false truths. Um, that there is a kind of complicity there in enabling the, 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 the horror of the North Korean regime. Um, is that fair then to use the word complicity? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
<laughs> I mean, that is not perfect. I don't know any other word one could use. I mean, complicity. I felt uh, it's such a loaded word. Um, to be honest, it makes me very angry. Um, because I just, I mean, with the problem of North Korea, you know, we're all complicit in many ways. And whenever people say we know so little, um, what that alone says, it's probably the most controlled, which means it's most abused place in the world. And why do we know so little? Like, it's also, wasn't it our job? If there's an abuse going on in the outside world where we don't have an equal level of abuse for us to find out because those people need help. So, I mean, there's that and, and all the, when we talk about truth and lies, and I feel like in this country right now, um, we are understanding when truth gets uh, manipulated into falsehood and or not being able to differentiate the two. I mean, North Korea is a perfect example where entire thing is a propaganda. Propaganda itself means basically lies uh, to serve a regime. So if the whole thing is set up that way, then what is beyond that? And I think one of the things that actually kind of drive me crazy is one of the things actually I got attacked on a lot, and it was actually brought up during your panel yesterday, this idea of undercover journalism. And, you know, sure, there's this undercover journalism that sort of gotcha kind of stuff to try to put people in a compromising position for some sensationalistic value. I mean, I don't even think that's journalism, you know? That's sort of deception for what ratings, TV ratings or something. In this other case, you know, I wish it was a perfect world where you can go into North Korea, interview people, and they can show you the gulag. That never happens. I, I read some of that criticism and I found it strange because th there is a tradition in journalism of that kind of undercover operation. Only in a devastating situation according to the society of ethics, right? Like a, it's, it's a journalistic ethic code that you only do it when it's actually uh, there's no other option, and also it serves an in international importance. There's no other way of doing it. And the fact that it's not possible to go in there and interview for real is because they're hiding things. So there's just no other way. And is this information important? Yes, because we are complicit all if we don't know anything that's going on in there. And what that also suggests is that it's that hard, it's that much harder. If they're hidden behind lies after lies after lies after lies, your job as a journalist, I think, is to uncover that. And you know, I'm fluent in Korean. Like, it's not, it's, it doesn't, it's because there's so many lies that you have to now unveil this one and there's another lie and you have to unveil that one. So all this method, undercover journalism, or the fact it takes so long and all the investigation around it, you know, I interviewed about a hundred defectors in all different regions and spending time with human traffickers and spending time with separated families, all to try to understand this world that first of all, you know, whoever I talk to, tell me a lot of lies. So I need to be able to sift that too. So I think that when pro problem is this much rotten, then it's harder. And there's a lot of parties that are complicit. I mean, this project was also evangelical church was a part of it too. Right. I'll, I'll let Michael jump in in a second, but one of the, one of the things that struck me in, in your book, um, this is true from in Spotlight as well, is how you were tasked with confronting deception after deception after deception. How your students would come and lie to you, to your face, all the time. And I just wanted to know, at, not even at a, at a human level, for, for you as well, Michael, um, and for both of you, uh, what it's like encountering dishonesty uh, as a journalist and, 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 and being faced with it all the time, constantly. Well, one of the things our two projects uh, have in common is, uh, as we were saying, uh, complicity. Uh, in the case of the clergy sex abuse, this was a there was a really a conspiracy of silence. Basically, every institution uh, in, in Boston, every institution in, in America, every institution in every big city, uh, including uh, news organizations, including the media, was basically there was a tacit agreement that there would be hands off the Catholic Church. No one would ever investigate the Catholic Church. Uh, and this uh, included uh, district attorneys, this included uh, U.S. attorneys' offices, uh, and the reason was because uh, these were holy men. Uh, these were, as I said before, the most trusted people in the community. Uh, I think uh, 
one of the most unsettling aspects of our investigation was that the lies were coming from the very people who purported to be the most moral people in the community. The lies were coming from the men who claimed to be the holders of the truth. Uh, the, the hypocrisy uh, is, is astounding. Uh, it's, it's shattered. It shattered, uh, I think it shatters people's faith in humanity. So I think, I think what we uncovered was uh, really, really difficult for lots of people to believe. And when we proved our stories with the church's own internal documents, you know, the outrage was just sky high. I mean, people were just, were just uh, it was like a firestorm, uh, an earthquake. I mean, people were just utterly outraged. There's a, there's a very memorable scene in the film version of Spotlight, uh, where after you've published the article and set up, set up a hotline for tips, it's just ringing non-stop. Yeah. yeah, so it was as if, uh, if the dam had burst. Most of the people who were calling in were, were victims, uh, survivors. And what had happened is because of the church's uh, lies of, over centuries, uh, many of the victims were made to feel that they were the only one, <clears throat> that what had happened to them was a very rare circumstance. And very often they believed that because this was so rare, they were somehow responsible uh, for what had happened to them. They often felt guilty uh, because they didn't want to um, uh, sully the reputation of a priest. They didn't want to do anything to hurt a priest's uh, career. But once our stories came out, people realized that they were not alone. People realized that they weren't the only one. People realized that it wasn't their fault. People realized that there was a systemic problem here. And once that happened, uh, it was like a, a, a mass movement to the phones to call the Boston Globe and say, hey, wait a minute, me too. This happened to me too. Uh, and, it, and, I, and I was hurt by it, and it was wrong. And, uh, and the, the dam just uh, burst. I mean, there were so many lies for so many years and so many decades that we were just happened to be at a point when the Spotlight team came along that the whole edifice was just ready to collapse. And we, we smashed a hole into the wall of silence, and the edifice did begin to collapse. I think... <laughs> but this, I mean, I think this idea of lies is a really, I mean, that's a, one of the themes, which also does go with complicity, right? Complicity has a lot to do with also truth and lies. But I did think about that a lot because if it's a world that is built on lies, system built on lies, and my position was also lying, because you know I'm not an evangelical, fundamental evangelical uh, school teacher. So um, then, you know, I kept thinking about that concept. Sorry, just just be clear. The university where Suki taught was set up by evangelical Christians um, in South Korea and in the U.S. and elsewhere as well. Around the world around the world, and it's this staggering reality that the elite of North Korea are being trained to further their regime with money from evangelical Christians all over the world. Which is also lies, because the evangelical, fundamental evangelical Christians are in there saying they just want to educate them, but their real goal was to convert them. Um, ultimately, one day when the great leader falls, these are the most devout people who are basically in a cult ideology, so you just swap great leader with Jesus and you have a perfect population that will be converted. So I can understand where the logic of that is, but you know the dishonesty was also on every side. The regime kind of pretends to not realize that, while well, they know that they're Christians, but they take the money and then they tell them to never talk about Christianity. So it's like they're pretending not to be Christians, right? So it's like in every way there were lies, but then my students also lied for no reason whatsoever all the time. And the lies just went, I think this is what it was, because it really is difficult to be lied to all the time. In a world that is all lies, you turn on the television in North Korea, it's all the great leader stuff, and it's all made up, fabrication. So um, they celebrate the victory day, 7-27, and the North Korea did not win that war because <laughs> there's a division, DMZ, you know, the fact that the war was paused means nobody won, but they celebrate. So this, this absurdity of lies everywhere, plus I think the students lying to me, and I think this is when it got really heartbreaking and also I guess interesting is that I realized I was looking at lies in my own black and white way. There's a truth in lies, and it's actually not true. 
They're different kinds of lies. The fact I'm lying to be here because I have no choice in a way to cover the truth of North Korea. Lie was the only way for me to be getting an access into that country. They were lying either to survive because they've only been taught lies. They can only repeat lies. Sometimes you are brought up in a system of lies. You can't tell the difference. So all these different levels of lies when I could now see it, then I wasn't sure anymore if lies are a bad thing or what do lies mean? Because I am not from this world. And what does it mean for these young men that I learned to love so much, who are so human and adorable and funny, are stuck in this world where this was their everyday reality? I think that's when it became unbearably depressing and heartbreaking. Michael, <laughs> um, when um, one of the interesting revelations of, of the investigation was that much of the material that you needed to conduct the investigation had in some form has been made available to the Globe years before. Um, did, did the fact that, that, that the Globe had not investigated um, as it might have, might have done better at the time, did that prompt soul searching within the newspaper and within the team? Sure, uh, it did prompt a lot of soul searching. Uh, I think uh, this is something that we didn't really understand that we had missed this story until the director and the writer of the movie Spotlight were doing some research, and they were the ones who, who uh, stumbled on the clip uh, that showed we had the records of 20 abusive priests uh, some 13 years before the Spotlight team investigation. So we were, uh, we were pretty surprised and pretty, pretty astounded and pretty chagrined, and it did prompt uh, a lot of soul searching. And it just showed us that the conspiracy of silence, uh, it, it, included, uh, it included the media, it included the Boston Globe. Uh, you know, I guess uh, I, I'm, I'm compelled to say that in our defense, you know, we now know that there was a clergy sex abuse crisis in every major city in America. And we know there's a major newspaper in every major city in America. And, and, and no one wrote this story until uh, these four people and Marty Barron came along uh, on, the, on the Globe Spotlight team and decided to investigate. But yes, sure, it did prompt a lot of soul searching. And uh, I have to say one thing I like about the movie Spotlight is that it shows our, it doesn't portray us as uh, knights in shining armor. I mean, it does show our flaws. It does show us making mistakes. It does show us going down uh, blind alleys. It does show us uh, occasionally losing patience with one another. And uh, you know, yeah, we, you know, we could have, could we have done better? Yeah, we could have done better. Could we have acted sooner? Yep, we could have acted sooner, uh, but, uh, you know, we finally did. Uh, we finally did act, and boy, when we did, uh, uh, set off an earthquake. And we're still feeling the tremors today. Just a slightly different note, but on the film, I, my twin brother is in the audience. Uh, works at the Washington Post, and wow. all his colleagues are uh, really amused at how good uh, an impersonation of Marty Baron um, was made in the film. Were you happy with Mark Ruffalo's performance of yourself? <laughs> Yes, I was very happy with Mark's uh, performance. I can't imagine uh, anyone better. There was a time uh, when, it, when it was going to be Matt Damon, and uh, that, that would have been fine, but I'm so happy that it ended up being Mark Ruffalo and I. You know, Mark uh, and I hung out quite a bit. He came to my home. He shadowed me at the Globe, and we talked for hours and hours and hours, and we realized that uh, we have very similar family backgrounds. Uh, we uh, had very similar politics. He, he looked at my bookshelves, and it turns out we liked the same writers. And of course, we have the same initials. I mean, it started to get kind of started to get a little strange. Uh, but everybody I know who saw the film said, "Man, you know, Mark, Mark just nailed you." Uh, and I got to say, all of the uh, actors in this movie were just tremendous, and all of their portrayals were fantastic, including Liev Schreiber, who who really did not get to spend much time with Marty, and still uh, registered this terrific performance. So all the actors, uh, you know, they, they, in a sense, they were like the Spotlight team because they agreed to participate in an ensemble film, which most actors don't want to do because they always want to be the star. And, uh, you know, they did have to swallow their egos. And, you know, we did the same thing on the Spotlight team. You know, when you work uh, collaboratively uh, on a project uh, uh, like a Spotlight team investigation, you know, you do have to do your very best work, but at the same time, you know, you do have to swallow the ego a little bit in order to work effectively together. So in that way, the movie was really kind of an interesting reflection uh, of the Spotlight team in a, in a way that I think uh, sometimes uh, many people don't appreciate. I've been flashed the, the, the perilous 10-minute warning. Um, 
So let me move on. Uh, when when the book came out and when the investigation came out, what kinds of responses did you get from, from the people who were involved or mentioned in the book and the investigation? Um, when the university found out the book was coming, uh, I was threatened repeatedly. Um, I mean, I knew they would be upset, but threat was the next step. Uh, then I got attacked uh, by actually the um, other reporters for going undercover. New York Times did a feature story on my deception, which I found uh, then I didn't understand why, uh, how else I could have done this and why they weren't focusing on what was in the book. After all, this is about the psychology of the future leadership in the final year of Kim Jong-il's life. In a, you know, it's a country we don't know, we don't have any inside information, and whatever that is in the book would explain, at least try to explain, the one thing we don't know about North Korea, which is the psychology. You know, we know about the Wikipedia information, how many gulags and et cetera, that there's a famine, but we don't know how they are thinking. And I thought I had presented this uh, information that I had spent 10 years researching and risked my life for. So I was really uh, mystified why this reaction was coming, but it just didn't stop. Then the book was labeled as a memoir, not investigative journalism. And um, and then you know then the attack came where it was uh, I was called a kiss and tell memoirist, uh, where somehow my expertise was just stripped, and I became eat pray love sort of North Korea way, <laughs> and I really I mean it became almost a part two of this battle where why is it that I had a book contract long before the book actually undertaking the book. And, and have gone through this intense investigation. The book is literary, because that's what I do. I really didn't think if I were, and also people thought I just went home. No matter what I say, I was attacked for being sort of an ESL teacher, the teacher story, you know, as if I went and taught English abroad and came home and wrote a book. So this other spinning that kept happening was really surprising to me. And I realized, oh, this was now, Another battle. I ended up writing an essay for the New Republic. I was just going to plug that. It's a very good essay. You should all read it. About, right, like if I were actually a, a white male. It's a field where all the experts are actually white, unless you are North Korean defectors. Those are victim literature, right? But the authority belongs to actually this foreign correspondence and all the people, with scholars. But there's actually no Korean who's writing about, no, and also I'm Korean American. But somehow I think that I became the girl who went home. So I think, and then it was disqualified from all the journalism awards. So I think this battle was just mystifying. It's, and I felt, where I felt, I think my anger was more that, why don't you look at what's in the book? Because this information is actually valuable. It's a psychology of the future leadership. And if you were to actually focus on that, instead of um, smearing me, or you know, taking away my expertise, then you know maybe we could use this information and direct it to the right audience who might make a difference to that devastated world. So I think it just um, was. I mean, it was heartbreaking in a different way. I think the established. Uh... I think the established, the, the established uh, experts were just envious of what you've uncovered and what you've, been, you've written. I think that was a big part of it. Uh, we had a very different uh, reaction uh, from our series. You know, when we were doing our reporting, uh, the church uh, dropped uh, the, the veil of silence and no, no one would talk to us. Cardinal Law, somewhat famously, Cardinal Law was the uh, Archbishop of Boston, the senior prelate, a senior Catholic prelate in America. He's a man who hoped he would be the first American Pope. And uh, he would not sit with us, wouldn't talk to us, and very famously, uh, his uh, press aide told us that he was not even interested in seeing what our questions were. We offered, at the, at, at the end, we offered to fax over a series of questions, and he said, don't bother, we don't even know, want to know what the questions are. Uh, after the uh, series came out, the, the reaction was so just, I mean, it was wild. Uh, and it was wild because we, we 
proved our case with the church's own internal documents. After that, Cardinal Law basically went on an apology tour. Uh, he was giving a, a, holding press conference after press conference. Uh, I remember uh, in every, at every press conference he was asked, are there any more abusive priests who are currently working in the Boston Archdiocese? And he said no. And I remember at his third press conference, he was asked for the third time, uh, and he got angry. He lost his cool. He said, now get this straight. There is not a single priest credibly accused of abuse working in the Archdiocese. And a few weeks later, as we began to get more and more documents, they started pulling priests uh, out of uh, work left and right. Uh, so the, the, it was clear to everyone that Cardinal Law had spent his entire career covering up and lying about this issue, and the lies hadn't stopped. Uh, so we continued to do our work. We, we added four very good reporters to the Spotlight team. So we had eight reporters, and we wrote another uh, 600 stories over the course of a year until Cardinal Law finally resigned and uh, fled to the Vatican. <laughs> Um, we're unfortunately running out of time, so I'm going to uh, move ahead and tell, remind the audience that these are both very multi-talented writers. Um, Suki was her first book as a novel, and I believe you might be working on another novel now. Um, and, uh, and Michael is also a screenwriter. Um, so I wonder if I could ask you guys to talk a little bit about um, your relationship to, to screenwriting and your, uh, in, for you, Michael, and, and fiction for you, Suki. I know you've said that you find them completely different. I mean, they are different, but you find them extremely different practices. Um, so I wonder if I could just engage you to, to talk about that. Um, I think that fiction, uh, yeah, I think of fiction and journalism to be such different brains in a way, but I guess when it's um, like a long form literary journalism does employ fiction or uh, techniques. And I think that, you know, I mean, in this book in particular, uh, what I was trying to really deliver was the humanity. And the humanity then could really be, you know, enriched in, dis in descriptions. So I think that all my fiction or, uh, you know, I guess the fictional part of me the, as a writer was constantly trying to discuss, bring you to Pyongyang, the, the, the reader. So it's not just information, but that what it felt like, what, what the buildings, you know, not only the color, but to look at them or what these young men were like, because they're complex and humanity is really complicated. And it's really difficult for a, a reader who's sitting in Boulder to relate and love these characters. But we do that in fiction. You know, they don't exist, but somehow we're in love with these characters in fiction. So I think that that technique really works in a subject like this, which is really impenetrable. But also, it's really hard to reach because it's such a different world. And I think that I did that in this book. You know, there was a concept of lover, the idea of beloved that I put in this book. And I think, you know, some readers didn't understand why she's talking about a lover in Brooklyn, but that was necessary because I felt that through this method, someone sitting in Brooklyn could relate to, through me, because ultimately you're seeing Pyongyang through me, and then feel like, this world is accessible. And for that, I needed to uh, you know, bring all these other unconventional methods that you do in normal journalism writing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where maybe fiction and nonfiction and journalism can meet to really enrich a subject, so, make it come alive. You know, this, this is something else that Suki and I have in common because uh, you know, I'm, I'm an investigator, but I'm also a communicator. And uh, very often I write stories that are, that are quite long for a newspaper, 5,000 words, 7,000 words, 8,000 words. And in order to get people to read to the end of the story, I uh, employ novelistic uh, techniques for some of the re same reasons that Suki was just explaining. I mean, I, I will use uh, cliff, I mean, everything is absolutely fact-based. Uh, I never imagine any internal uh, monologue. I, I never uh, imagine a scene that didn't happen, absolutely not. Uh, however, I will use cliffhangers, you know, to end a particular section of a story. I will think very carefully about how I'm going to structure it so that it's got some narrative tension and some narrative uh, direction. 
so, and I also try to write, uh, as, as Sugi was just saying, uh, very evocatively. I want people, I investigate uh, wrongdoing that is sometimes very complicated, but it always has an impact on real people. And I, I want people to understand uh, the impact that the wrongdoing I've investigated has on the lives of ordinary people. And so, uh, so I often write uh, like a novelist just to bring the story alive and, and get people to, to read the whole story, which I happen to think might be quite important. Um, could you talk about your screenwriting? Sure. Uh, you know, there was a, I, had, I started at the Globe as a political writer, and I had uh, a pretty satisfying career as a political re uh, reporter. I covered local, state, and uh, national politics, presidential campaign, and I got the idea that I might want to do something different. I, I studied in school to be, I thought I would be a novelist, frankly, and uh, had a, a brief association with journalism, and it kind of grabbed me by the throat and never let go. And so I was uh, really thinking about leaving the globe uh, to, pers to move to Los Angeles and pursue screenwriting. Uh, and then Ben Bradley Jr. called me and uh, said, uh, what do you think about working on the Spotlight team? And uh, you know, to me, there was, there was no better job in American journalism than uh, having a spot on the globe Spotlight team. So uh, I really didn't hesitate. I said, sure, that sounds great. And uh, that was 15 years ago. Um, <laughs> and now I'm at a point where I think, gee, I'd really like to still pursue uh, this other uh, uh, this other aspiration. And so uh, I have uh, I'm going to write a screenplay based on an investigation I did of a horrible uh, place called Bridgewater State Hospital, which is not a hospital at all, but it, uh, a state prison that houses guys who are mentally ill. And uh, I wrote something like 30 stories about Bridgewater State Hospital. Uh, there was a, a young man there who was killed there by guards. Uh, I exposed the cover-up of, uh, of the death of this young man. And as a result, uh, it's very, very satisfying. The place has been completely uh, reformed. And uh, they've stopped uh, the practice of holding uh, men in solitary confinement. They've stopped the practice of strapping them down by their wrists and ankles. They closed, uh, I call, it was called, uh, ironically called the intensive treatment unit. I, it's really just, it was a torture chamber. So anyway, uh, I'm going to uh, take a leave of absence from the Globe and write, and write a screenplay and hope to uh, further the message that I was able to, li to deliver in my newspaper stories. Well, I think we're all looking forward to that. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to you all. Who has questions? Is a gentleman in the back? This question is from Michael. Are you satisfied with the response of American laws and society and the Catholic Church to the criminality you exposed? And if not, what would you see as a satisfactory response? Well, I think as far as uh, the United States of America is concerned, I think the response has been uh, pretty good. Uh, four months after we published our first stories, <clears throat> United States Catholic bishops got together in Dallas uh, for an emergency meeting, and they produced a document called the Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People. And it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good document, and uh, it really, I think, has gone a long way to prevent clergy sexual abuse in the United States. I mean, I don't think, uh, by any stretch, all the bishops in America are adhering to the provisions of this document. One of the provisions to go to the criminality aspect of it is the bishops in America are now required uh, to report uh, suspicions or evidence of uh, clergy sex abuse to civil authorities, i.e. the police or the local district attorney. Uh, I think the response uh, from the Vatican has uh, not been in, as encouraging. Uh, three years ago, Pope Francis appointed a commission to come up with protocols that can be implemented globally uh, to prevent clergy sexual abuse, and that commission has not produced anything, nothing. Uh, Pope Francis also said he was going to establish a tribunal for bishops who cover up clergy sexual abuse, cover up for the abuses committed by their priests, and that plan has been completely scratched. Uh, so I think uh, the response of uh, the American bishops uh, was, was pretty good, and the response of the Vatican has been, uh, to the survivor community, extremely disappointing. If I can just follow that up, Fasuki, what kind of, um, did you when, you, when you were publishing the book, when you had written it, you'd lived the experience, uh, eventually you wrote the manuscript, it gets edited, it gets published. What were you hoping uh, might, did, were you hoping that anything uh, in terms of policy or in terms of the way the world treated North Korea um, would change? Did you have any expectations? Well, I mean, I think it was empathy. I was after always. And what that means really as a writer, the best I could do is give you the most 
full portrait of this world that I can give you. And to do that was to approach them from every different angle that I could do. So the complexity of them comes through. And I think it's only the complexity. Once we, you know, it's like when we fall in love because of all this, uh, different things that make up that person. And I think we de then we become very curious. Like, I, we want to know what kind of food you like and you know what you were like as a child. We become very curious. And I think that's how uh, character is in a book. So through this book, by humanizing them, giving all the, you know, because people always ask me, are North Koreans, you know, as like basically robots? No, you know, there are all these doubts and, and, and belief and disbelief can all coexist and how horrifying it would be for a human being to be in that world. So that I felt if my readers could see that and fall in love with them, then they will become curious. Then they will learn more. Then they'll ponder upon this question and become worried and maybe do something, you know? And I think that's the best I could do as a writer. In the gentleman in the front. Thank you. Very nice expressions. Uh, somewhat on the theme of complicity, it seems you interacted with the students very closely. If they came to you, and maybe they did, and asked you about the life in the United States, about democracy, about free press, etc., would you have told me, or told them, or did you tell them anything like that? And also, what was the state of science and technology education of the students? Did they read modern science and technology? Thank you. Um, so the school was a science and technology, uh, but there were actually no science teachers of science and technology teachers there but only English language teachers. Since then, they claim there are uh, teachers specialized in that. But how would they be making a bomb without science? Because North Korea is very compartmentalized, so uh, hackers will be hacking a small set, and I guess weapon makers make weapons. These students didn't even know what the internet was. Their curiosity, them asking questions, what is the outside world like? I was under a strict order not to tell them any of it. I was watched 24-7, and there were students who were also reporting on my conversations with them. So um, it's not a place where you can ask questions like that anyway. But on top of it, I think that, uh, you know, possibly getting them in trouble was always a concern. So even if they were to ask me, then I wouldn't really be able to tell them anything. But of course I would, because they were like my children. I mean, these are not kids, they're 20 year old young men. But if you are abused, you're very infantilized. So you actually are a lot younger, seemingly younger than your age. So I think that that dilemma of how much to tell them and not tell them and what was the right thing to do was always a question. And it was the most stressful, depressing question that I struggled with uh, every second. You got to show them Harry Potter. I did finally show them Harry Potter, <laughs> which was a huge uh, moment of, uh, in a way, victory, just because they were curious from having read one paragraph in the ESL textbook about Hermione and Ron, and um, they somehow uh, realized this was a big phenomenon in the outside world. Uh, and uh, one of the missionaries had a DVD, so I was able to show it to them the evangelical school staff became uh, furious with me because they said that this was filth. Uh, Harry Potter is evil, is what they said, and they wanted to show Narnia. Um, so I had to fight with them uh, to only, they, and then they told me I taught two groups of students, 24 students, 26 students, and they said I could only choose one group to show it, was my compromise. Uh, so that's like, I guess, biblical almost, having to choose one child over another child. So I finally did show it, and I thought they would be, you know, naively, and I think this is how much we don't understand each other in some sense. I really assumed, by then I really knew them well, I thought, as much as anybody could, and I thought it was a special effect that they would be reacting to. But actually, uh, through the semester I've been teaching them this art of essay writing, which they couldn't grasp because essays are about critical thinking. 
one thing not allowed in North Korea is critical thinking. So they didn't know how to do like introduction, thesis, sentence, proof, uh, conclusion. None of this structure made any sense to them. So essay became a concept they hated and could always roll their eyes when essay came up because I kept drilling essay writing. And in the movie, Hermione says, oh, I have to write an essay <laughs> for Professor Snape's class. And they all went, oh, in that moment, <laughs> watching the film. And then afterward, they all said, Professor, Hermione doesn't like essays either. <laughs> and it was really one of the most touching moments because there was a connection. This was about connection with this girl in this movie in the outside world. Could we uh, pass the mic to the lady over in, in the third row? Oh, uh, two points. One, have you ever heard Michio Kushi's line? He was the macrobiotic king in the 1970s. And he said, the greater the front, the greater the back. No, I wasn't familiar with that, but I, <laughs> but I see the relevance and it sounds like there's a lot of wisdom in that. And this, the second thing, I just wanted to mention an article that I can't stop talking about was in the Atlantic this month, and it's called um, How America Lost Its Mind, and it's about truthiness. And I want Stephen Colbert coined that word, it now seems more relevant than ever. Can you speak to, journalistically, each of you, about this problem we're having right now with truthiness? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, very, it's a very serious problem because uh, we, we are at a point where some people seem to think they're entitled to their own facts and their own version of reality. Uh, you know, once upon a time, everyone could agree on the facts. We might disagree on what to do about them or where to go from, from where we are. So uh, it's, it's, it's very, very troubling uh, that people can't agree on, on what reality is, what the facts are. Uh, it's very difficult for a society to come together in any meaningful way if we can't have some fundamental agreement on what reality is. And there is reality, and there are facts. Uh, so I think it's just critically important now for journalism to be fact-based and for people to really make an effort, for readers, viewers, listeners, to really make an effort to distinguish between, say, fake news and real news. You know, I, I think we all do have a, a collective responsibility. You know, I have, a, I have a responsibility to print nothing but the facts. And everybody out there who's consuming news has a responsibility to try to make some effort to get uh, news that's factual so that they can carry out their responsibilities uh, in a democracy uh, in, uh, in, a, in a competent way. Do you see a distinction, sorry, do you see a distinction between the kinds of long-form work that both of you do, the, the sort of deep, investigative, many years of, of, of work, um, and the sort of churn of day-to-day -day journalism that most of us are immersed in as well? Yeah, I think there's, of course, there's a great uh, difference, and you know, I think there's a, a great value in news organizations who will pursue the truth and who will take the time to pursue the truth. You know, I'm very heartened about this, really. You know, now, because of technology, we have some tremendous uh, analytics. What I mean by that is when uh, the Boston Globe or the, or the Washington Post or the New York Times post a story, post their, their stories online, I mean, we know at the Boston Globe which stories are being read the most. And we know, we even know what's the average amount of time people are spending on a particular story. When this technology was introduced, I gotta confess, I was really nervous. I thought, wow, I mean, is, are people really reading my 7,000 word long stories? What if they're not? And, but what do you know? People love these stories. And we're finding that uh, people really like long form journalism, uh, the spotlight stories, but also long form narrative journalism. And people are subscribing because of these stories. Uh, and I find that very encouraging. Also, I mean, I think some subjects just, that's what you need. You need a longer time investigating and you need a long, uh, longer form. I mean, I think that one example would have been, I mean, something like North Korea, which is just constantly deception. Then, for example, the year I was living there, uh, the university, which is funded by in evangelicals, was the fanciest probably school with all the elite sons who all looked very healthy. And, and you know, normal height and just very also good looking. I mean, these are, you know, the sons of leaders who probably all married Miss North Korea, right? <laughs> so it's a very photo, for, uh, photogenic kids. 
But that year, actually, all the universities in North Korea were shut, and all the university students were in sent to construction fields to do manual labor for an entire year. So the reality was that the university students were not in a college playing basketball and learning English. But the regime, for example, they invited BBC to come in. And they came to the school and were allowed to film it for a couple of days and went home. And now that news reporting is actually delivering lies. And it became a press release for the regime's wishes, delivering actually untruth. So I think that when we are dealing with a subject like this, you can't just do a quick research and then just put it out there. <laughs> because what you've just done has really, will have consequences. You know, especially when the media, the network is so big like that. And now the world thinks North Korean students were happily playing basketball, looking that happy and healthy. But think about the whole, whole how many numbers of them actually doing manual labor. Um, the question in the back, the gentleman standing up. And I think after this, we'll take, we'll collect a few questions as well. Suki, this is for you. As you know, on a worldwide basis right now, the single crisis that we're all facing is what is going to happen with North Korea and North Korea's uh, nuclear program. Knowing what you learned uh, in your experience about the culture of deception and lies and, and brainwashing, um, what advice would you get? Is there any possible way that diplomacy is going to prevail, or is uh, Kim uh, Jong Un, uh, dear father, our, our dear leader, is he uh, just uh, hell bent that it's going to be nuclear uh, weapons that he's going to use at one point? I mean, the whole nuclear question is just obviously something North Korea is never going to give up. This whole North Korean threat, however, is nothing new. I mean, the only new thing in this apart from the fact that we have now confirmed fully the nuclear power, but we've known that for a while now. I mean, the only difference here is actually the American reaction. Because, you know, we do have a president who is um, constantly also uh, countering with a, a similar messages back to North Korea, with also his administration saying the opposite things. So the US is actually the, the, what is different in this latest episode with North Korea. In reality of reaching any resolution, none of the, nothing has changed and nothing will change. Would, I mean, one of the questions most commonly asked is, is, is this regime crazy enough to really detonate a nuclear weapon and kill everyone? Um, one thing, obviously, they're never going to do is they're fighting for is, is to prevent the regime change because it's all about the regime. So it's a place where they'll sacrifice anything and everything, you know, including the death of over a tenth of their population, which is how much they died about like 15 years ago in a famine, and also just enslaving, enslaving everyone, just keep up with this myth of the great leader. So, uh, you know, They'll do whatever they do to survive, actually. So, you know, that doesn't mean that this has threat or not, not threat. I mean, I think it's just a dictatorship that will, that's invested in survival. So I think that this problem is actually an unworkable problem. So, I mean, as unworkable as it is, diplomacy is in the only um, solution, isn't it? Is to change the people inside somehow. It's not really also possible, really. Let's collect about three or four questions and then finish. The lady in the front. Can you specifically tell us some of the things that your students believe and spoke to you about the nuclear program? Like what you said, you know, Can you specifically tell us some of the things that your students believe and told you about that you knew were untrue? <laughs> Okay, Thank has you. one, let's, let, let's get some more. Uh, the lady in the back with the red hair. Uh, hey, a su uh, question for Suki. I was wondering about um, more specifically like the day-to-day -day lies you had to say for your safety. And I was wondering about 
but we're at the hardest lies to keep up with and you know either because you don't like the lie or because it was like hard to remember okay. uh, any questions from michael the lady in the back I want to thank you for Spotlight, because as a Native American Canadian, I wanted to know if you know that the priests, the worst offenders, were sent to residential boarding schools. They were sent to the most remote places, and the most terrors happened there. I'm sorry, my grandmother was raised in a residential boarding school. And I'm still very upset that America doesn't face what's happened here to Native Americans. I wonder if you're in your investigative journalism, if you found out anything about what the priests have been doing and the nuns with Native Americans. Okay, and I think we have one more question over there, yes. The lady in the black shirt. Uh, you should talk into the mic. Uh, how do you pick stories for Spotlight? You spend such a huge amount of time researching them. So how does the team select of all the things that come across your desk? So, Michael and Suki, which one do, who wants to go first? Listen, I think uh, you have every right in the world to be really, really upset about what's happened at the boarding schools and what's happened in uh, Native American reservations uh, all over North America. And uh, it is true that uh, there's, a her there's been a horrific problem with uh, religious order priests who have gone to work in these institutions. Uh, I know a lot about the problem with the Jesuit order and uh, the abuses that Jesuits committed in very remote places uh, all the way to Alaska. Uh, this is a problem that I think has probably been underreported, uh, in part because many of these institutions are located in rural areas where there is not much of a media presence. But you're absolutely right that this is a terrific uh, and horrific scandal, and more needs to be written about it. There's no question whatsoever, and there needs to be a, a lot more uh, accountability among the religious orders who sent their priests to these areas, only to, uh, only to abuse uh, mostly young children. Uh, as far as the spotlight team goes, that's an excellent question. You know, we never want to be in a position where we spend six months on a story and come up with nothing. Uh, so I think part of the, the art of running an investigative team and part of the art of being an investigative reporter is to know when to keep going and when to abandon ship and choose another story. Uh, I like to think uh, as the years have gone by, I've gotten a lot better at this. Uh, I, I, you know, also, the, the, the longer you work at this, you kind of develop a list of things you want to work on. Um, it, it, is, it, is a, it is a danger of investigative reporters believing there's a story there, believing there's a story there, and there might be a story there. But I always uh, ask, ask two questions uh, when I'm trying to make a decision about what to pursue. One is, is it a story? And then if it is a story, the second question, the all important second question is, can I get it? And what I mean by that is, are there documents? Are there people who uh, at the end of the day are gonna speak on the record? Can I prove the case? And if, uh, sometimes it's very painful you know in your heart there's a story there, but if you can't see your way to proving the case, you should probably pick another story. I think lies, I mean, it was such a, a prevailing theme, but prevalent theme, but I think um, be lying, of course their lies are hard, but my lying was really hard. One of the tough, with students I really try, I mean, I, in, I would do everything to somehow be as truthful as possible, as hard as that might seem. But with, I think it was really hard for me to actually pretend to be an evangelical Christian. Because there was a Bible study in a secret room that was allowed, and these were my colleagues, 30 of them, really hardcore fundamental evangelicals that they just wanted to move to Pyongyang, live there forever, and bring Jesus. And I, had, I just also don't know on all the, first of all, we were not allowed to talk about it. So you don't really say anything. You just say like M, meaning minister, like J means Jesus. So they say like, according to Roman, you know, something, something was said, and I had like no idea what they were talking about. So I'll just say yes, 
<laughs> so I mean, I think that was always this like I was so scared I would be found out and then I would be kicked out. And I it, so that was hard with students. Um, you know, they will say lie-wise, I mean, not lies, it's just because of what they've been taught. They will ask me things like, so does everybody outside, do they all speak Korean? And no, they don't. But I mean, I, I'm not really allowed to say that. So I said like, well, they don't really, I mean, they have their own language, but sometimes Korean gets spoken because I speak Korean with my mother and my mother lives in New Jersey in America. So yes, Korean does get spoken in America which is true. So you kind of try to go around it. I think one of the toughest questions though was um, when they asked me, because they've got so little. These are the elite kids, they have just nothing. So they're so proud of their nation and they're so proud of their city of Pyongyang, which is the most beautiful city, the most beautiful country in the world. And they would ask me, so professor, do you find our city very beautiful? And I, I don't find Pyongyang beautiful. I mean, Pyongyang is a really a concrete gray city, but on top of everything else, it's a select citizen can live there. Everyone else is outside, basically slaves to the regime. And Pyongyang is where the privileged few get to live. And I think this concept of Pyongyang itself was just sickening to me. I couldn't even look in that direction. The school was in the, in the suburb of Pyongyang. And you can see it in the distance. And some days I couldn't even look at it in the distance. And I couldn't tell them any of that. So, but I knew that they like needed to hear from me that it was beautiful for them to feel like at least we have this beautiful city. So I think, you know, when so little can be said, then you just kind of get it, understand each other through silence and, and censorship. So I think I just said some of it is the most I could do. And I, I remember still that look of disappointment when they didn't hear me saying it was the most, and, and that lie, I couldn't lie to them that it was beautiful. So I mean, it was this kind of complicated moment, which was just broke my heart. Well, thank you both. Thank you for sharing your incredible work with us. And thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Suki Kim, Michael Resendez, and Kanish the War. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Michael Resendez will be signing books downstairs. Suki, unfortunately, will be not be signing, but please feel free to go downstairs. Thank you.
if it's conducted right and with conviction, then it would be politics. So I do uh, make different calculations and I don't go into areas that I think are really dangerous needlessly. Um, I think I'm different than a lot of Christmas because I keep going back to the same stories. The greatest minds in the world are yours uh, and it is a wonderful thing uh, to have happened and something we are all enormously proud of. Thank you very much for coming back.